Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to what I understand to be the 19th installment in the Talking Dispute series. My name is Robert McDougall, and I'm a senior fellow at ICTSD, uh, and I'll be moderating today's session. As you may know, the Talking Dispute series is co-organized by ICTSD uh, and WTI advisors. It's meant to promote discussion of specific international trade disputes among a broader audience. And for that, we bring together uh, a number of experts who present the key implications of disputes uh, and then facilitate a discussion uh, among the experts and, and others such as yourselves. Uh, in today's sessions, we're going to discuss the appellate body report in the Russia pigs dispute, uh, otherwise known in its long form as Russian Federation measures on the importation of live pigs, pork, and other pig products from the European Union, or by its dispute number of DS-475. This is an SPS dispute brought by the EU against measures imposed by Russia in response to an outbreak of African swine fever in parts of the EU. And the measure and the dispute take place in the broader context of tense EU-Russia relations uh, as a result of sanctions imposed in connection with developments in Ukraine, and we'll hear uh, somewhat about that. More technically, though, the dispute raised a number of interesting procedural uh, issues and substantive SPS issues. We're going to focus mostly today on the obligations related to the regionalization of SPS measures and the implica implications for mechanisms for crisis management uh, and regulatory cooperation uh, at issue in the dispute. Of course, uh, discussions and questions of other elements of, of the dispute and of the reports are, are welcome as well, and the experts can, can address those as, as they can. Uh, before we start, though, just a few additional housekeeping points. Uh, first, of course, the organizers would like to uh, sincerely thank the, the permanent mission of Mexico to the WTO for its valuable support in, in organizing this session. Uh, second, as you see from the back, the cameras, uh, in order to bring this discussion to a wider audience, it is being live streamed. Uh, so welcome first to those who, who may be looking at this online. Uh, we will be taking questions from, uh, from online viewers and we'll uh, ask those at the end uh, as, as much as we have time to do so. Uh, and finally, you'll find in front of you, uh, as part of the package of material that's been distributed, uh, feedback forms. And I really would encourage you to fill those out at the end of the uh, session uh, and leave them as you go. Uh, it does help the organizers uh, in, in making these uh, sessions as relevant as they can uh, for you. So turning to our, our esteemed expert panel today, we uh, have obviously four speakers. Uh, and there are more detailed biographies that are made available in the, in the package of material that, that most of you should have in front of you. Uh, but just by way of brief introduction, and again, in the order in which they will be making the presentations, uh, we have first on my, on my right, the first presenter will be uh, Ms. Maria Alcover, uh, Maria's counsel at the ACWL, the Advisory Center on WTO Law, uh, prior to which she worked at the appellate body for a number of years, appellate body secretariat. Uh, she has completed advanced studies in international law, international economic law, and, and policy in Barcelona. Maria is going to provide an overview of the key findings of the appellate body report. Uh, to my left, we'll be speaking second, is Dr. Anait Simbatyan. Uh, and she's an experienced international trade lawyer, has authored over 60 publications of issues of international trade and international justice. Uh, she also teaches international economic law at the Russian Foreign Trade Academy, the Diplomatic Academy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation, and the Russian People's Friendship University. And NIE is going to comment on some of the legal implications of the dispute. Uh, following her will be Dr. Craig uh, Van Grastek. Uh, he teaches po the political economy of trade policy at the J JFK School of Government at Harvard University and has published extensively on the, uh, the economic, political, and legal issues uh, arising around the creation of the WTO. He has also consulted for numerous countries in his firm, uh, the Washington Trade Reports, monitors and analyzes current issues in trade policy. Uh, and Craig's going to comment uh, primarily on the international, on the international trade relations. Uh, and finally, our last speaker will be Ms. Lorenza uh, Jassia, uh, who is at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the UNECE. Uh, she's currently the secretary of the UNEC's Working Party on Regulatory Cooperation and Standardization Policies. And in that role, Ms. Jassia is striving to for increased cooperation uh, between the United Nations and standardization and conformity assessment bodies. Lorenz's comments will focus primarily on the regulatory cooperation aspect of the dispute. So uh, let's turn it over to the experts then, uh, and we'll start with uh, Maria. Thank you very much, Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to ICTSD and WTI advisors for inviting me here today. 
um, as Robert said, in the next 15 minutes, I will try to summarize the main appellate body's findings in uh, the dispute Russia picks. This is a dispute that was um, in initiated by the European Union in 2014, when Russia stopped importing live pigs and pig products from the EU for sanitary reasons. The EU brought a dispute before the WTO dispute settlement, and it raised multiple claims under the agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary measures. So this is a pure SPS dispute. As we will see in its report, the appellate body provides some useful guidelines for WTO members to better understand what their obligations are under Article 6 of the SPS agreement, which is a provision that deals with regionalization of SPS measures. I find this provision to be particularly important for big WTO members, like the EU or Russia itself, where even when a specific pest or disease is present in some areas, in all likelihood, the same pest or disease might be absent of uh, other areas. So I will be focusing mainly on this specific provision, Article 6 of the SPS agreement. To give you a little bit of background first, uh, live pigs and pig products have been traditionally exported from the EU to Russia on the basis of bilaterally agreed veterinary certificates. These certificates are even referred to in Russia's accession protocol. There's one condition that has to be met in these certificates for live pigs and pig products to be imported into Russia's market. And that is that the entire EU, except for the island of Sardinia, must have been free from African swine fever for the previous three years. And uh, African swine fever uh, is uh, apparently a highly contagious disease with uh, high mortality rates as high as uh, 100%. So what happened here is that after uh, <coughs> ASF was detected in the swine herds of four EU member states, namely Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, Russia stopped accepting uh, imports of live pigs and pig products, not only from these four EU member states, but from the entire EU, uh, considering that the EU was no longer meeting with the requirement in the veterinary certificates. The EU brought the case before uh, the WTO. It presented multiple claims under the SPS agreement. And in particular, it noted that Russia had failed to take into account that there were areas within the EU that were free from ASF. And the panel found multiple violations of the SPS agreement, including a failure by Russia to adapt its measure to the regional SPS characteristics uh, in the EU. That's the specific context of this dispute. Um, as Robert mentioned, of course, there's a broader context here, which is the rather tense political relationship that, uh, that exists between the EU and Russia since 2015. Uh, um, and uh, this uh, tension at the political level with trade sanctions imposed by the EU on Russia and counter sanctions being imposed by Russia might have some implications in the compliance stage of this dispute. And we might discuss this later on. For now, let me focus on the legal issues, the four legal issues that were before the appellate body in this case. Um, I will not be focusing so much on the first one, the one you see in blue. This was a preliminary issue dealt uh, by the panel, and it was whether the measure was really challengeable before the WTO. Uh, here, Russia presented several arguments. Russia argued essentially that the measure could not be attributed to Russia because Russia was merely following what was agreed in the bilateral veterinary certificates. So Russia was merely responding or reacting to the fact that the EU could no longer comply with the condition of being ASF free in its entirety. Um, Russia also argued that it was just following what was already included in its accession protocol, and therefore it should be presumed to act consistently with WTO law. Both the panel and the appellate body rejected these arguments and considered the measure to be attributable to Russia and therefore challengeable under WTO dispute settlement. So I'm gonna focus on the other three issues under appeal. Uh, 
they all related to Article 6 of the SPS agreement, this provision that deals with the regionalization of SPS measures. This article has three paragraphs, and each of them was appealed in this dispute. Russia appealed the panel's interpretation of paragraph 3 and 1, and the EU appealed the panel's interpretation of uh, paragraph 2. I'll follow this order because that's the order that was followed by the appellate body. We'll start with the panel's interpretation of the third paragraph of Article 6, Article 6.3. But first, let's take a look at the text of Article 6. It's longer than, than this, but I just copied the relevant part of uh, each paragraph. As you see, the first paragraph of Article 6 imposes on WTO members an obligation to adapt their measures to the SPS characteristics of the area from which the products originate and to which the products are destined. Paragraph 2 of Article 6 imposes an obligation on members to recognize the concepts of pest or disease-free areas and areas of low pest or disease prevalence. And finally, Paragraph 3 imposes an obligation not on importing members but on exporting members claiming to have areas that are free from a specific pest or disease to provide the necessary evidence to objectively demonstrate two things, that these areas are indeed free from a pest or disease and that they are likely to remain so. So Russia started appealing this, the panel's interpretation of this third paragraph um, of, article, of Article 6. What did the panel do here? Essentially, the panel examined the evidence that was presented by the EU when claiming that there were areas within the EU that were free from ASF and concluded that indeed the EU had objectively demonstrated that there were areas within the EU and within the four EU member states involved that were free from African swine fever. And the EU also objectively demonstrated that these areas were likely to remain free except in Latvia. So for Latvia, the EU could objectively demonstrate that there were areas that were free from ASF, but it could not objectively demonstrate that they were likely to remain so. These were the findings made by the panel. And Russia considered that the panel erred when interpreting Article 6.3 because it failed to take into account two things that, uh, according to Russia, are included in Article 6.3. The first thing is that um, the panel failed to find that Article 6.3 requires also taking into account the evidence relied upon by the importing member, Russia in this case. And according to Russia, the panel also failed to find that Article 6.3 somehow contemplates a period of time for the importing member to examine and analyze the evidence and then adapt its measure. What the appellate body said, the appellate body disagreed with Russia. And essentially considered that Russia's arguments were misplaced. The appellate body noted that Article 6.3 of the SPS agreement focuses on the exporting member, on what the exporting member has to do. And this is a provision that when a panel analyzes it, it should really focus on whether the evidence provided by the exporting member is of nature, quantity, and quality sufficient to enable the importing member to make a determination as to the pest or disease status of the exporting member. So the obligations of the importing member, Russia, are regulated elsewhere in Article 6, paragraphs 1 and 2, but not in paragraph 3. The appellate body also considered the argument of the period of time to be misplaced again, because Article 6.3 does not deal with any period of time, uh, and uh, periods of time are dealt elsewhere in the SPS agreement, in particular Article 8, and Annex C of the SPS agreement, which provides that members should undertake their procedures without undue delay. So all in all, the appellate body agreed with the panel's interpretation that Article 6.3 really focuses on what the exporting member has to do. And in this case, the EU did provide some, uh, some evidence that could demonstrate that almost in its entirety, the EU had areas free from ASF. Then Russia appealed also, the panel's interpretation of Article 6.1, a little bit in relation to um, its appeal under uh, Article 6.3. To recall, Article 6.1 is the one imposing on members the obligation to adapt 
their measures to regional SPS characteristics of the place of origin and destination. Here, what the panel did is recalling its previous finding that the EU had objectively demonstrated that there were areas within the EU that were free from ASF, and therefore considered that by imposing countrywide bans, Russia failed to adapt its measure to specific regional characteristics and therefore failed to comply with Article 6.1. Russia disagreed, of course, with respect to imports from Latvia. Because as I just mentioned, with respect to Latvia, the EU could not demonstrate that those regions that were free from ASF were likely to remain so. And here the appellate body in this specific part sided with Russia. The appellate body observed that Article 6.1 indeed imposes an obligation on importing members to adapt SPS measures to regional conditions. And this is an, on, an ongoing and an autonomous obligation in principle. But in practice, the appellate body recognized that in many cases, whether the exporting country that's best placed to gather this type of information really complies with Article 6.3 and provides the necessary evidence to demonstrate that there are areas within its territory that are free from ASF, will have implications on the ability of the importing country to really comply with its obligation to adapt its measure to regional SPS characteristics. So in this particular point, the appellate body concluded that the panel erred in not taking into account its previous finding with respect to Latvia, for which the EU failed to demonstrate that the free areas were likely to remain <coughs> so. Um, and therefore, Russia could not be expected in this particular part to adapt its measure to the SPS conditions um, from Latvia. The ultimate conclusion of the panel that Russia did not comply with Article 6.1 uh, remained, but for different reasons, not for this particular one. Finally, with respect to Article 6.2, the last ground of appeal, that was appealed by the uh, EU. Let's recall that Article 6.2 establishes the obligation to recognize the concepts of regionalization. And here, essentially, what the panel concluded is that the obligation to recognize these concepts is an obligation to recognize them as an abstract idea. And the appellate body disagreed. It considered the obligation to recognize as an obligation to render operational the concepts of pest or disease-free areas and areas of low pest or disease prevalence. Now, members have different options to render these concepts operational according to the appellate body. Members may have a regulatory scheme in place or a structure that accommodates these concepts ex ante, or members cannot have a, reg a regulatory scheme in place, but they can follow the practice to giving an effective opportunity to exporting members to claim, to make a claim of regionalization. Both options are valid as long as they really render operational these concepts. So the appellate body here reversed the panel's interpretation of uh, the concept to, to recognize, although unfortunately it wasn't able to complete the legal analysis. So in sum, um, and this is my last slide. What do WTO members need to know with respect to their obligations under Article 6 of the SPS agreement? What's the takeaway? Uh, WTO members have, first of all, an obligation to recognize certain concepts of regionalization, the concepts of pest or disease-free areas, and areas of low prevalence. And this means rendering these concepts operational. So it's not enough to just recognize them as abstract ideas. Members also have an obligation to adapt their measures to specific SPS characteristics of the areas from which products originate and are destined. And in principle, this is an ongoing obligation and an autonomous obligation that all members have when imposing SPS measures. However, the appellate body has recognized under Article 6.3 that sometimes if an exporting member fails to provide the necessary evidence to objectively demonstrate that it has areas in its territory that are free from a certain pest or disease, these will, of course, have implications for the importing member's ability to really adapt uh, its uh, SPS measure. So the appellate body um, considered that there's some sort of a necessary cooperation here between the member that's best placed 
to gather the necessary evidence and the member that is supposed to adapt its measure to regional SPS characteristics. So with this, I conclude um, my presentation and I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Great, thanks Maria for that uh, introduction to the dispute mm -hmm. and to the, the pellet body report and, and highlighting some of the key, key legal findings. Let's go to our first commenter then uh, for uh, uh, a reaction to Anait. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to um, uh, stress that we cannot close our eyes on the fa fact that uh, the prime cause of the measure at issue was where mutually, uh, mutually agreed conditions of validity of veterinary certificates. I, uh, I, I stress mutually agreed conditions, and in this way, a very interesting question arises as to the applicability of articles of <coughs> responsibility of states for their internationally wrongful acts. I mean that consent by a state to the commission of a given act by another state precludes the, 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 the wrongfulness of that act. Because, uh, because the, the, the WTO agreement is not a self-contained regime, but, but an uh, inherent part of public international law. And I think that this issue is not so hypothetical as it seems at first glance. Thank you. Uh, my pre yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And I proceed. Uh, uh, no, I have, uh, I have no other call. Uh, now is my presentation. Uh, thank you. In my comments, I would like to, st to address two points, just two points. The first one is the relationship between accession protocols with multilateral trade agreements, and the second one, the interpretation of recognition concept under Article 6.2 of the SPS agreement. The conclusions made from these two issues in Russia Peaks dispute require a very serious consideration. So at the outset of its analysis, of the relationship between accession protocols between uh, between accession protocols and the SPS agreement, the panel stated that it has to examine whether Russia can rely on its terms of succession to effectively shield the measure from further scrutiny or, uh, under the DSU and the SPS agreement. But, but by posing the question in this way, uh, the panel in fact uh, predetermined the subsequent light line of its argumentation. In particular, the panel concluded that if a member claims that a provision within its accession protocol allows it to depart from other obligations in a multilateral trade agreements, the text of such a provision should at least have clear language to that effect. Uh, the systemic defect of this approach is in the fact that due to the legal drafting methodology, the vast majority of accession protocols and working party reports provisions do not di directly refer to specific articles of multilateral trade agreements. At the same time, each provision of any accession protocol has intrinsic objective links with the relevant articles and paragraphs of multilateral trade agreements based on th th their subject matter. And these links, I think, should be established subsequent to a very deep and comprehensive analysis of respective provisions. Otherwise, the defendants in disputes arising from accession protocols find themselves in a very difficult, not to say disadvantageous position. We all remember how China had been, in fact, deprived from its inherent right to invoke defense under general exceptions due to the lack of reference in its accession protocol to Article 20. And there is another very important point. Uh, I think that for the completeness of its analysis, mm. the panel had to examine not only scope of Russia's obligations under paragraph 893 of its protocol, but also the very essence of complaining parties' rights and obligations mm. under this paragraph. Because uh, I am deeply convinced uh, that accession protocols are not one-side agreements. It follows that it could be the case when an accession protocol not only sets forth positive obligations of an exceeding member, but also WTO minus rights of existing members in their relations with this, this particular exceeding member. Why not? Because any accession protocol is a deal, and we cannot a priori exclude such a development. Uh, turning to the interpretation of recognition concept in Article 6.2 of the SPS agreement, I would like to recall that up to this date, it was firmly established in the WTO jurisprudence uh, that members are required to recognize uh, 
that members are required to recognize the idea or area of free or low prevalence status in the abstract. Since the text of the first sentence of Article 6.2 does not refer to the manner in which a member shall recognize concept of regionalization. The panel in Russia Peaks Dispute uh, co confirmed this approach. It found that the acknowledgement of particular abstract ideas for the purposes of Article 6.2 is less stringent than the obligation of ensuring that the measure is adapted to the SPS characteristics of an area under Article 6.1. The panel clarified, and I cannot but agree with it, uh, that equating the obligations under different paragraphs of Article 6 would lead the first sentence of Article 6.2 to redundancy and inutility. Moreover, equation of obligations set forth in different paragraphs of Article 6 could lead the panel to act against the principle of effective treaty interpretation. Uh, the appellate body uh, dis disagreed with the panel and, uh, in fact, uh, actually invented a new obligation in respect of recognition concept. In particular, the appellate body attached excessive significance to the fact that Article 6.3 envisaged that the exporting member may make the claim that areas within its territory have free or low prevalence status. The appellate body explained that the importing member has to, to maintain a practice of or a process for receiving such claims for, from, an excess, for, from a, an exporting member affected by a specific SPS measure and thus render operational the concept of regionalization. The appellate body concluded that Article 6.2 requires the importing member to, uh, to provide an effective opportunity for exporting member to make the claim. Thus, if until now, dear colleagues, uh, the prevailing view was that the WTO members are required to recognize the idea or notion of areas free or low prevalence status in the abstract, now we have to read Article 6.2 as requiring the importing member to provide an effective opportunity for the exporting member to make the claim under Article 6.3. I regret that I cannot accept this line of arguments. In this regard, I would like uh, to recall the statement of Sir Fitzmaurice, uh, a distinguished international lawyer and national judge, that uh, the existence of international obligations should have clearest justification for, for it, based solidly on the language of the text or on necessary inferences drawn from the text. An inference, according to Sir Fitzmaurice, can only be regarded as a necessary one if uh, the provision cannot operate or will not function without it. Getting back to Russia Peak Dispute, I would have agreed with the appellate body regarding the interpretation of recognition concept, provided that the second paragraph had been the only one in Article 6. That is not the case. There are three paragraphs in Article 6 of the SPS agreement, and I would like to stress that being interconnected, these paragraphs are, are, are addressing quite different aspects of obligation to adapt SPS measures to regional conditions. Obligations under the three paragraphs of Article 6 are uh, legal grounds for independent legal claims, and I think they, they should not be intermixed. I also respectfully draw your attention to the words used in Article 6.2, recognition of concept. Uh, I think that it was the very intention of the drafters to use this soft language. Uh, otherwise, they would have drafted this obligation in the most stringent words. Uh, for example, a member shall implement principle of rule of re regionalization, but they decided to go the other way, and I think that this choice should be respected. I'm deeply convinced, dear colleagues, that an obligation that rests on mere implication, but not on the text of an agreement that does not exist, and having deviated from the text of, the, of SPS agreement and clear language of Article 6.2, the appellate body, in fact, inven invented a new obligation for, in respect of recognition concept, an obligation with a very high threshold for importing members. Uh, I think that such lawmaking is rather difficult to reconcile with requirements of Article 3.2 of dispute settlement understanding, which precludes the dispute settlement body from adding to or diminishing the rights and obligations provided in covered agreements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. Thank you for that uh, additional assessment of, of some of the <coughs> issues raised.
Uh, we'll turn now to Craig for uh, his comment, uh, which I think is in the context of the broader international trade relations, uh, and you don't have a presentation. No presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, that, that is correct. I'd like to, uh, to change gears a bit. I, I, I appreciated both of the legal analyses that we've heard, but I've been asked to, to discuss this wearing my political scientist hat, although uh, also I'm an historian in this area. And taking a step back and thinking about where this case fits uh, in, in the broader trading system, I'm actually quite encouraged by it. I'm quite encouraged by it for what has not happened. What we have managed to do so far in this case is what I think the system expects us to do, which is to maintain a separation between high and low politics. There's the high politics of war and peace and sanctions and counter sanctions and uh, the crisis that we have in Ukraine today. And there's the low politics of trade and investment and the rules that we have. And the system that we have as set up, uh, first in GATT and in the WTO, has always expected us to try to maintain a separation between them. And I think that so far, we've been rather successful in seeing to it that, that this case has not been cross-contaminated uh, by or with the other case, uh, which is the political ban. Now, basically, I'll be making three points here. Uh, one is that this has been something we've been trying to do from the start of the system, and it was relatively easy to do in the GATT period because GATT contracting party status was shared and exercised by a relatively small number of countries, and the Cold War, which really coincided with the, with the GATT period, did not bleed into uh, GATT politics precisely because of the limited membership. But under the WTO, we have a much wider membership. It is virtually a universal organization. Every country in the world is either in or negotiating to get in. And so the number of disputes that potentially could breach that wall that should exist between high politics and low politics is increasing dramatically. But so far in this particular case, uh, we have seen the parties and all involved uh, manage to maintain that separation. But the third point, and I'll return to this in, in, at the end of my comments, is I see coming down the road a number of other threats. One is still related to the implementation of, uh, of what has come out of this case, but there's a few others uh, that we have to look to, and they worry me. So this separation between high and low politics, as I see it, in the development of the system, we have created four barriers four barriers that we, uh, we hope are going to prevent countries from using the WTO or the GATT before it as a forum in which we bring up our political and security disputes uh, uh, with one another. The first is we hope that when countries do have conflicts, they don't use trade restrictions as an instrument of leverage. Uh, we hope that to the extent that we have a trading system and we have other issues, that they don't naturally imply uh, conflict between them by countries not engaging in sanctions. That often, however, does get violated. So the second barrier is we hope that if countries do use trade as an instrument in other conflicts, we hope that an injured party does not bring its complaints to this forum, but rather brings it to another forum. And we've seen that be honored in this case. So we have sanctions and counter sanctions in the Ukraine crisis as between the West and with Russia. That first barrier was breached. But what I find encouraging about this case is although this particular case is contemporaneous with and somewhat overlaps in its product coverage, the political ban. This case begins in January of 2014, the pigs case. The sanctions and counter sanctions get imposed later that same year, and they involve some of the same products. But one could read the paper trail of this case. You could read the complaint, read the panel report, read the appellate body report, and at no point would you get a sense that there is any other conflict as between the European Union and Russia. The only time you see any reference to the political ban is in some of the statements coming from the EU, and, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Those are, those are statements. But the arguments and the issues, we've managed to maintain that separation. So that has been good. The third barrier is GATT Article 21. And this is where it gets difficult. If countries do bring security-related complaints to GATT and now the WTO, 
we permit the country that took the action to invoke GATT Article 21, the national security exception. And so far, that has been a moot point in the present conflict. No one has invoked Article 21. But it's the next barrier uh, that I see a, a problem in the future, not in this case. If countries do fall back on GATT Article 21, that invocation is not reviewable by panels or by the appellate body. That's not a rule, that's a norm. That's a norm that has been respected throughout the GATT and WTO system. And if you look in the GATT period, there's really a very small number of cases that we know about uh, in which there was either an implication of a country invoking Article 21 or a formal case of someone invoking Article 21. And about half of them were related to the Cold War and half of them were related to, uh, to other issues. But the norm has been that if a country does invoke Article 21, first of all, there's the political reality. We understand that if we were to have, essentially, trade lawyers in Geneva reviewing a country's invocation of what are its essential security interests, this would pose a lot of problems back in the, in the home government. If you have to have the trade minister defending an institution that has challenged the turf of the defense and foreign minister, that's often a non-starter. So the recognition that if countries were in a position of having to defend their invocation of essential security interests were subject to review by trade lawyers, the recognition that a countries under those circumstances might actually think it's better uh, to leave the WTO than to leave their issues under review in that sense, that has led to the point that we do not have panels and we do not have the appellate body review those invocations. The other leg on which that principle stands is the expectation that countries will not abuse this right. Countries will not simply invoke their essential security interests every time they're in danger of losing a case. And if you look at the history of the uh, jurisprudence of Article 21, there's only one case that people ever point to of a country apparently abusing Article 21, and that's the Swedish footwear case in the 1970s where the argument was made in Sweden, we have to protect our footwear industry because, after all, soldiers need boots. And uh, this, was, this was really a, uh, a very difficult argument for Sweden to make. Uh, political pressure was put on Sweden, and the restrictions were in place for less than a year, I think, in the end. But even in that case, uh, the systemic interest of, of the, uh, the trading system was recognized in not formally challenging the country's invocation uh, of GATT Article 21. So this case, as I say, so far we have not had that cross-contamination. But where I want to end my comment is on the dangers I see arising from other cases, one of which is related to this and one of which is not. Assuming for the time being that this particular case does not lead to an invocation of Article 21 in the compliance phase, so we're out of the woods on this case, there's the related Ukraine excuse me, UK, Ukraine transit, you try saying that, the Ukraine transit case, uh, DS-512, which is at a very early stage of development. Uh, and in that case, uh, there very definitely are issues involving both trade and security, and one could well imagine an, invo an invocation of GATT Article 21 in that case. Even so, I'm not terribly nervous about that because it, there would be very legitimate security-related arguments to be made in such a case. So if that were to happen, uh, it would be potentially embarrassing, potentially difficult for the system, but one that it could handle in the same way that it handled previous cases. The case that makes me much more nervous is not where a country has a claim of a legitimate security basis, and that claim on its face seems to have legitimacy to it, and it has a, an economic action it has taken that it is defending, but rather if we have a repeat of the Swedish footwear case. And that's the problem we have in Washington. In exactly the same way that Sweden was abusing the system a generation ago and invoking national security to impose restrictions in this one area, there's a very serious danger that a law that no one has talked about for a generation is coming back. And that's Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. 
When I first started working in Washington in trade in the early 1980s, this was still a law that we used and a law we talked about in the context of energy security. But it's one of a series of trade laws in the United States that have receded into the background in the post-Uruguay round period. And no one heard tell of Section 232 until um, about a month ago, six weeks ago, when the Trump administration initiated investigations for steel and aluminum. And in both cases, I think they're seeing the path of least resistance. This is a very easy way under US law for the president to impose restrictions uh, on trade. And in this case, it's not a medium-sized country like Sweden. It's the biggest trading power in the world. It's not a small sector like footwear. It's steel and aluminum. And the steel and aluminum cases, assuming that they don't just fizzle out, we're going to end up in a very short period mm -hmm. facing one of three very unpalatable alternatives. One is my expectation is that the Trump administration wants to use these cases as a way of manufacturing leverage in order to negotiate market sharing arrangements. At which point, uh, the Article 21 issue does not appear. It's no longer a security issue, but it's much more problematic for the system uh, on an economic basis. Or the United States imposes restrictions under Section 232, and the two alternatives that emerge from that are either a, we get away with it, or B, we really are challenged. And by getting away with it, I mean that the United States would invoke Article 21, and in keeping with the existing tradition here, that invocation would not be challenged. A panel and the, and the appellate body would say, based on our existing jurisprudence, we're not going to challenge the country's invocation, which on its face would be uh, an abusive use of Article 21, and the problem there is other countries would be encouraged to do the same thing. And then the other alternative is there is a challenge, and a panel and or the appellate body say, you know, in some cases we really have to review the legitimacy of a country's invocation of 21, and that's problematic as well. Getting back to that original foundational insight of the, of the people who who set up the GATT and then the WTO, that we want to maintain that separation, and countries have to have the authority at some point to uh, declare what is an essential security interest. And that challenge, in an environment where we have a President of the United States who says that the WTO has been a disaster, he does not like multilateralism, he's really not very much in favor of free trade, and we have our security interests to look out for, the recipe there, the mix is one where I think the implied threat of the United States possibly to leave the WTO might become explicit at that point. So uh, not to get too far outside this particular case, this case is an example for me, the pig's case, of how security issues should be handled, which is they're not handled here. But the U.S cases that are now at a very early stage of maturation worry me a much greater deal. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for putting in the, in the context of that broader high politics trade uh, matters. Uh, also identifying some of the boundaries that we have managed to, s to protect, but some of the risks that might be on the horizon. Uh, lastly, uh, and obviously not least, uh, we turn to Lorenza for her presentation on regulatory cooperation. Thank you, and thank you very much once more to ICTSD and to WTI to, for, for the invitation. And uh, as I am the secretary of the only intergovernmental, war, uh, intergovernmental body in the United Nations system that has really at the center of its mandate uh, risk-based and uh, standards-based regulatory cooperation, I would like to take a different look at, uh, at, the, at the case we have before us and to put aside for the time being the panel report and to look instead at the system of uh, regional cooperation between Russia and then later the Customs Union and the European Union in the field of SPS and in particular in the field of veterinary uh, inspections. So my take on the issue is going to look at uh, the EU-Russia memoranda that I will introduce and, uh, and ask the question, did these instruments and did this system uh, fail to provide an adequate framework for the management of this crisis? 
Or in other words, are we looking at a systemic crisis in this system or not? Or is the system still a valid one? Which, uh, to borrow the language that Maria was using before, the system, is it still a valid option to operationalize the, uh, the language of Article 6.3? So before I delve into that, I would like to present to you some data. And uh, uh, looking at the data, you see that uh, this was an important trade flow. It was about $2 billion uh, uh, US dollars. And uh, not only that, but uh, uh, the EU really was a dominating partner on, on the Russian market. In some subsectors of the, of the swine products, it represented almost 100% of the, of the imports into Russia at, at, uh, at the, before the crisis started. And then you see this sharp drop when, uh, when these measures were imposed. And so this, uh, these uh, uh, measures that were imposed represented a very important blow to the uh, meat industry this, uh, in, in the EU. But not only that, they were also uh, a very, uh, a very, uh, important uh, uh, blow for the Russian consumer. And uh, there were, at the time, news of shortages of meat on the, on the internal market. And that's logical if you look at the data, because uh, the EU is such an important trading partner. So in order to support this uh, very significant flow of trade, which was, uh, was an important uh, part of the bilateral trade between these two trading partners, uh, there was a, a complex system in place. And uh, so this system was based on two memoranda between the Russian Federal Service for Veterinary and Phytosanitary Surveillance uh, on the one side and the EU on the other side. But also there was uh, um, uh, another system of memoranda which was signed between uh, uh, the uh, Russian body and the EU member bodies, so uh, at the bilateral level. So taken together, these instruments were building a one-sided system that aimed at guaranteeing the implementation of Russian veterinary and sanitary requirements along the whole supply chain, from live animals all the way through to final products that were shipped to Russia. So this system, uh, interestingly, did not aim at developing common standards, developing common certificate, developing common ways of certification. No, it, it is one-sided in the sense that it represented like a way of recreating the Russian system on the EU uh, uh, marketplace, if you will. O on the EU, not marketplace, in fact, on the EU production uh, system. So uh, under this system, we had uh, meat and raw meat products that originated only and exclusively from slaughterhouses, cutting plants and cold stores that were approved by Roskaldnadzor for export to the Russian Federation. And these, uh, uh, these plants were included in a special list. Uh, deliveries could only be carried out directly from these establishments and uh, no intermediate uh, story, no splitting of shipments on, uh, after final certification. Uh, within the European Union, there was a system of pre-certificates, and then the pre-certificates were, uh, were uh, uh, finally complemented by a final certificate that was delivered by the last member before the shipment crossed the border to Russia. So on the basis of all the uh, other certificates from the other member states, the last uh, point of, uh, of shipment would deliver the final statement, and the shipment would leave to, to, to Russia. So this, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, complemented by some contingency measures that were uh, also specified in the memoranda. And they specified that if there was an outbreak of an uh, OIE disease affecting the chain of certification in any of the member states, the relevant products would be excluded from pre-export certification and would respect time limits that were set by Russia for lifting these restrictions. So uh, there were other contingency measures that uh, provided that uh, if the product had been uh, sourced at a time where a disease was incubating, uh, there, there were emergency safeguard measures that could be invoked. So the system was quite complex and quite robust. Uh, 
And the system uh, has also a specialized memorandum of 2006 that provides for zoning and regionalization, which is quite relevant to the case that we have before us today. And under this memorandum, uh, the, there was uh, a specific language uh, providing for immediate notification and also for risk-based flexible, flexible measures that would reflect different levels of risks and that would be enacted for the establishment, lifting and maintenance and controls of zones, including movement controls for the cattle. And uh, this um, memorandum included definitions of acceptable and acceptable levels of risks and provided for ways how risks could be identified and also managed, including by stamping out, by movement control and vaccination, among others. It also has some language for an uh, institution uh, that would be set up in the event of crisis with the possibility of, jo of uh, joint working groups being set up uh, so as to manage the crisis. And uh, finally, the decision to restart imports would rest with Russia, of course. Uh, and that is uh, uh, really, in a sense, an implementation of the system that uh, Maria was, uh, was introducing to us before. Now, uh, I'd like to compare this, uh, this system uh, against international best practice, and in particular, as a point of reference, I'd like to, to take the work of the UNECE group of experts on risk management and regulatory systems, and in particular, under this uh, body of best practice, we identify five processes that are really important in uh, developing risk-based regulatory cooperation. First one being establishing the context. Second, identification of risks, then followed by risk evaluation and uh, by choosing and implementing risk management strategies, followed by provisions for risk management. And the way we've, uh, we've uh, in the UNEC, we've elaborated the system is against uh, uh, risk management best practice as codified in standards and in particular in the ISO 31000 standard. Now, uh, in fact, when you look at the system, it contains a number of these, uh, of these elements and uh, a number of the features that uh, our model preconizes. So it has a well-defined objective, which is the establishment of a system of veterinary certification of the animal products exported from the EU to Russia. It provides a very sound way of identifying risks to the assets. In this case, the assets are basically the consignments. And the risks uh, are uh, to be identified by, on the one side, the veter veterinary authorities of the EU under the supervision of the federal, uh, uh, the Russian Federal Service for veterinary inspections. And uh, so uh, this system does not really have uh, provisions for risk evaluation, but it does have language of uh, about acceptable and unacceptable levels of risks, and also provides for uh, an alternative uh, ways of managing uh, risks, including risk measures that are spelled out. And uh, also quite interestingly, it has uh, language for uh, the management of crisis, it has language on contingencies, and uh, also it has language on institutions. So uh, uh, on this last part, I'd like to say that uh, if we take other uh, instruments that also we've developed about uh, crisis management within regulatory systems, we find that uh, once more the, the EU-Russian uh, bilateral system also uh, has significant features that uh, set it against uh, uh, this, well, uh, this established good practice. And uh, in particular, it has a clear definition of what uh, a crisis uh, uh, represents. So what uh, makes it a different situation that calls for a different uh, a uh, set of references to be instated. It also uh, has, uh, and that's quite uh, quite important. It uh, it calls out uh, to uh, uh, a number of uh, of stakeholders with their respective responsibilities, and uh, so it uh, it uh, provides for uh, some uh, some 
uh, appropriate mechanisms to uh, handle the crisis, including notification, exclusion of products from certification, blockage, recall, and so on. Finally, if we uh, compare the system against uh, other uh, mechanisms in the field of SPS, uh, for example, NAFTA or uh, uh, the system under the Canada-EU agreement, uh, we find that the system is uh, certainly quite unique, and, uh, but it has, um, issue, it has features that also have elements of similarity, in particular as regards the institutional aspects that we see also in NAFTA and CETA. There are uh, committees uh, set up and also uh, provisions are made in the uh, event of contingencies. And, uh, yeah, as I said, it is a unique system, and uh, it, uh, in, in that it does not aim at establishing uh, common, uh, common standards or common certification, unlike others, but, uh, but it, it, it seemed to have uh, suited the needs of the two uh, trading partners and uh, has worked well. And, uh, for example, I have uh, two examples of uh, other incidents that have uh, occurred over the years, and in particular in 2011, uh, there was uh, uh, an incident of avian influenza in the Netherlands, and in particular in the province of Zeeland. And in this, in this case, the system worked effectively with uh, the standard veterinary certificate that, uh, were, um, that I referred to earlier on. They were amended so that uh, after the sentence uh, that uh, they, the disease should not have been uh, present in the whole territory of the EU, uh, for the previous six months, there was uh, um, a little footnote added except the province of Zealand and the municipality of Dern that was added uh, in the certificate. So that uh, proviso had to be added onto the veterinary certificates and then the products could be uh, admitted to the Russian market. And similarly, uh, then uh, uh, um, again, uh, uh, more recent uh, a more recent episode, 2014, in December, uh, another another accident, uh, another incident, uh, sorry, as regards, again, poultry. Uh, again, the avian influenza here, uh, another uh, outbreak of this uh, disease, this time in the province of uh, Western Pomerania and Brandenburg. And again, uh, pretty much the same provision, uh, uh, the addition of a small uh, proviso to the veterinary certificate, so that allowed the system to perform. And uh, so I, I would like to conclude on a hopeful note that this is not a systemic crisis, that this is a system that keeps performing and that has its value. So I, I would like to, to close on a happier note than uh, the previous panels and, uh, and to say that uh, there's uh, there's uh, this system uh, has, uh, has uh, a potential to be a point of reference, and others that I also refer to uh, have also potential to be points of reference. And it would be interesting for research to look at the respective merits of these systems. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thanks for providing some bit more detail on the regime for crisis management and regulatory cooperation that's at the heart of the dispute, and also for your, your note of optimism at the end. Uh, before we open the floor for, for comments and questions from the audience, I just want to give each of the panelists uh, 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 the opportunity, not the obligation, but the opportunity to uh, make some additional comments, reactions to some of the other presenters. So I'll go in the same order in which we did the first pres presentations and ask Maria if she, if she wishes to make just a short comment. Thank you, Robert. Um, a very brief comment. Uh, I was trying to put together our four um, presentations and, and, and try to um, take something out of the four of them. And I couldn't help but noticing the irony between, on the one hand, um, what I thought it was the main takeaway from the appellate body's interpretation of Article 6, which I mentioned was um, that there was some implicit cooperation needed between the parties in a dispute. Um, uh, in order for members really to be able to adapt their SPS measures. So some cooperation needed in, a, in this dispute in which the parties were uh, in a tense relationship at the political level, so in not in a very cooperative uh, mood. So um, um, there's some sort of an 
of an irony there. And despite these political tensions, well, this dispute was brought before the WTO. So I echo what Craig uh, said. Uh, sometimes discussing with colleagues about national security exception, we usually say that WTO rules don't really work when countries don't want to trade. So whenever there's let's say a war, well, WTO rules are not useful anymore. And that's probably why Article 21 of the GATT uh, is not really reviewable by panels uh, or the appellate body. And I find it good news that in this case, well, there's been a trade dispute. Uh, these two parties still are very important trade partners, one to the other. They still want to trade, and that's uh, good news for the trading system. Thank you, Maria. Would you like to take yes, a thank you very much. I would like to also to comment on the security exceptions. Uh, my first point is that um, no measure is immune from review under the dispute settlement understanding. The second point is that uh, no party has unfettered discretion to determine the extent and the very existence of its obligations under the WTO agreement. And as far as I remember, in, at Nairobi conference, the Russian Federation proposed a WTO, that WTO members shall develop a general council decision on joint understanding on the interpretation of the scope of the rights and obligations of the WTO members under security provisions. And I'm deeply convinced that we, will, we would all benefit if, if it happens. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Well, just, just picking up that point about no measure is, is free from review, that's true. Uh, and in the, in, if you follow the legal journals that have covered uh, Article 21 over the decades, uh, often the case is made that there could arise a case at some point where uh, there would be some sort of review. The question is uh, whether this would be politically advisable to happen. I would just note the irony or the potential irony that, that of all the statements I've ever seen made about the reviewability of claims under Article 21, the one made by, if memory serves, it was um, the predecessor to the European Union at the time of the Falklands Malvinas crisis, uh, uh, not only invoked Article 21, but went out of their way to state as, a, as an absolute point of, of international law as they understood it, absolutely not reviewable um, by a panel, uh, cannot be questioned in any way. Um, that particular language in, in, in certain imaginable scenarios in the near future could, could come back to haunt them. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and my argument is that as long as we are dealing with cases where countries have made at, at there is at least a, 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 a case that passes the smell test. If you at least have some sort of legitimate or seemingly legitimate security connection and not simply using security as an excuse for achieving a desired protectionist outcome, uh, then the system can probably handle it. But it, to the extent that countries do begin, uh, if they begin, uh, to use national security claims uh, in order to achieve real protectionism, then we've got a serious problem. Thanks, Craig. And Lorenzo, would you like to answer? Yes, just very briefly, I am a strong believer in the power of the small system uh, that, uh, that uh, Craig was referring to, and uh, the power of the small decisions that are taken every day uh, among trading partners and the power that they have to also feed into international peace. Thank you. Great, thanks. And thanks to all the panelists for some additional comments. Uh, now, here's why we're here is for an opportunity for you folks to engage with these folks with your questions or your comments. Um, so we'll turn it over now f uh, for, for, for those questions and comments. Um, I will collect a few before we get the panelists to, to respond. And I would ask you to, um, uh, to um, indicate your name and affiliation when you take the floor. Um, so who's first? Hannes Schlimmann of WTA Advisors. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for this uh, fascinating panel. Uh, the breadth is breathtaking. And thanks, Maria, for uh, adding a, a very <laughs> a wonderful uh, angle to it, which is that in the end, we need to cooperate even when we fight. And, uh, and I think that's, that's really the story. Uh, it reminds me of the fact that in, in real estate, uh, uh, there is a, 
big contractors at any point in time will be in multiple litigations against each other and yet they will probably have lunch with each other all the time and do stuff with each other. Um, one of those guys is now running the United States, so uh, I hope he can apply that experience in due course, uh, Craig. Thank you very much, Craig, for this, uh, this high politics, low politics. I, about 20 years ago, I cut my teeth on the security exception and, uh, and found that it is eminently reviewable in part, namely whether or not something, the definition of essential security interests must be autonomous. No question about that. But whether a measure is then necessary to, uh, to protect those uh, national security interests once defined is something that could be reviewed, but probably on the level of the smell test or the smoking gun test. Um, and because that is so, the risk is real that at some point these cases may end up here. 20 years ago, uh, uh, Bill Clinton and, uh, and Tony Blair uh, decided to end the Helms-Burton dispute uh, at a meeting, I believe, in London, uh, precisely because the system would not have survived it, or at least that was the risk. So, um, but at the same time, I don't think we should be too afraid. I think the system can be reasonable, and the appellate body and panels have shown, especially the appellate body, well, I guess, and as well as panels have shown that they can actually tread that line. I think this case is really, uh, is really testimony to that. So I hope very much that that will that will continue to be the case. And another specific thanks goes to Anait for, uh, for doing what is always very necessary uh, in this building, which is that we get reminded of general public international law. Even if I disagree, I guess, with some of the points that you made, I think it's very important to, to, to keep reminding us of, of, of those points. Thank you very much. Great, thanks for that comment. Any other comments or questions? Yes, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Olga Mokin. I'm from uh, Russian Mission. I'm an SPS officials. I would like to ask um, certain questions regarding um, this case. So, um, would you agree that the conclusions made by the panel and the appellate body in this case revealed certain gaps in the SPS agreement? Uh, do you see any need to revise or update certain provisions of the SPS agreement in the light of the decisions uh, in this case? Um, how would you assess uh, the findings that the provisions of the members' working party report is inconsistent with the other WTO obligations? How would you assess the consequences of such findings in light of numerous specific commitments of WTO members set out in their working party reports. And the um, last uh, question is that uh, to what extent, in your opinion, in uh, the interplay between appropriate level of protection and regionalizations as reflected in this dispute is applicable to the interrelation of appropriate level of protection and equivalence. Thank you for all participants. Thank you. Great. Th thanks for those questions. Uh, quite a number of them. And when we get around to, uh, to, to answering them, we'll, we'll, on we'll only get the panels to answer the ones that they feel that they have um, uh, something to say. Uh, any other questions down here? Yes. Thank you very much for those excellent presentations. I had a question to Craig, if he could remind us of the section 232 and the implications of it. Also, um, you know, um, um, I mean, in terms of measures that may be reviewable under Article 21, um, I also think along the way that, you know, probably all these issues would be better to be uh, settled in discussions and uh, cooperative frameworks and that I'm not sure uh, it would be in the interest of a uh, you know, trading system that one questions national security decisions, uh, because as we see now, this backlash to globalization means that many countries are uh, bringing back uh, the idea that they would, that the sovereignty issues are important, that people don't want their sovereignty of their country to be lost or limited in any way. We see with Brexit also. So I think that uh, actually these uh, national security dimensions will be interpreted in a much broader way than before, uh, as far as countries themselves are concerned. So I would uh, 
very much uh, there is a precautionary measure that it's better not to open up uh, these articles and, and think cases or have interpretation or understandings that are inexact uh, unless members are ready to really renegotiate and clearly state the rules in a revised uh, Article 21. Thanks. Question. Those questions, and we'll take one more uh, set, and then we'll turn to the panelists. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you uh, for this panel. I have a question for Craig. Um, if, if perhaps something could be clarified about the security issue, uh, the national security issue, the energy issue relating to this, um, to your discussion, and also to see if you could direct us to some law review journals or economic journals that could help us clarify. Because uh, just listening, what you find is there's even more dirty secrets behind some of this, and which is why sometimes they make it a security issue. Great, thanks for that. Lots of good questions. Uh, I'll turn then to the panelists. Uh, uh, my recollection here is we have uh, at least five s areas of questioning. The first set of questions related to any gaps in the SPS agreement and there's a need to update set of questions around the relationship with the working party report and then also the relationship the appropriate level of protection. Perhaps the SPS lawyers would be the ones to answer that. Lots of questions obviously for Greg around uh, a little bit of more detail on, is it 232 or 322? Um, measures that may be renewable under Article 21 uh, and a little bit more clarification about the security issues. And you know, probably everybody might have some comment on those questions. So who wants to go first? Maybe the, the two. Okay, yeah, there are there are some questions, and I thank you for them about Section 232. Um, when I first started working in trade in the early 1980s, it was during the time of the Reagan administration, and that was sort of the second wave of 232. Uh, Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962 actually has its origins in the mid 1950s. And the U.S. coal industry at that time was very concerned that we were switching our consumption of energy from coal to oil. And for protectionist purposes, it was very clearly um, uh, the interest of people in West Virginia, uh, they started making the argument that oil imports are contrary to U.S. national security because they're coming from the Middle East, this volatile area of the world, and we can't depend on them. So there were a series of actions taken during the Eisenhower administration. The law became uh, codified in Section 232 in the Kennedy administration. It was invoked a number of times in the 60s, uh, 70s, and into the early 80s in energy cases. But in the Reagan administration, they used it for a few other products as well, like machine tools. What's the basis of 232? Uh, there's no injury determination. We're used to in the trade remedy laws, whether it's anti-dumping, countervailing duty, or safeguards, for there to be an injury determination, which in the United States is by the U.S. International Trade Commission. USITC has nothing to do with Section 232 cases. 232 cases are originally in the jurisdiction of the Secretary of Commerce. And the language, as I recall, and again, this is hazy for me because it's been decades since this law has, has been really active in, in U.S. policy, uh, if imports are found to threaten to impair the national security, and the typical notion is there are certain things that we have to be able to make for ourselves, so machine tools or certain types of weapons or things that are considered to be strategically necessary. It's sort of the flip side of during the Cold War we had a lot of export restrictions on supercomputers and helicopters and other things that, that, that might be useful for a potential adversary. This was, we have to impose restrictions in order to ensure that we can continue to supply for ourselves these types of goods. So this law was, was either considered or invoked a number of times in the Reagan administration and not since. The last time anyone tried to bring a case uh, was in the uh, Clinton administration, 
and my colleague, Robert Lawrence, we teach together uh, at the Kennedy School. We have taught together for 17 years now. Uh, he was on the Council of Economic Advisors at the time, and the argument was being made that we have to restrict imports of steel because steel imports threaten to impair the national security, and in that case, the Council of Economic Advisors is the one that shot the case down because they investigated and they found that I believe Robert told me 5% of U.S. steel output goes into defense. And uh, the argument then was made, if you really need to have uh, uh, certain types of steel for defense purposes, you can stockpile, there's various other things you can do, but for them there was a smell test and that argument did not pass the smell test. Well, I think the reason that the Trump administration is very interested now in Section 232 is it is the path of least resistance. Uh, you don't have to go through the USITC. If we had a safeguard case, that would go through the USITC. It takes six months to get anything from them. Um, there is a schedule for the conduct of an investigation by the Department of Commerce, but that can always be hurried along. We're now in the stage where they have called for comments and there will be a public hearing and any interested party self-defined uh, can provide comments uh, to the United States, but it is something that the President can take action on quite quickly. It has one other thing in common with the, with the safeguards law, which is, yes, they're both potentially reviewable in the WTO, and we know that no one since the Uruguay round has been able to successfully defend a safeguard action. I nonetheless anticipate that if in the, in the, excuse me, the Trump administration, if there were a safeguard case, uh, they would make a vigorous defense of it here, but they may anticipate that in the case of a national security case, uh, I hate to overuse this term, but the national security argument trumps uh, anything else because Section 232 is the analog to Article 21. Uh, will it happen? It depends on whether or not uh, we actually have import restrictions imposed. And if you look specifically at the order from the President to the Secretary of Commerce in the Steele case to uh, investigate certain points, one of the points that the Secretary of Commerce is explicitly directed to investigate is whether our security concerns would be properly addressed by the negotiation of, uh, I don't think they use these terms, but essentially an international market sharing agreement in Steele. So I expect that that's the next shoe to drop in this area. But uh, I think that uh, by the end of this year, we will know what, uh, what is going to come of this case, of these two cases, steel and aluminum. And by the way, there may be other products as well uh, that will be subject to investigation. We have rumors about various other products like solar panels, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, thanks for that. Anna, do you want to make some comments? Thank you. Uh, regarding the question um, as to the need to review the space agreement, I think that we have no a, any need to review it because today's problems are not in the text of the space agreement but the interpretation of the provisions of this text by the appellate body. And I think what we need today, it uh, could be uh, the, the decision on interpretation on Article 3.2 of Dispute Settlement Understanding, which precludes Dispute Settlement Body to add or diminish rights and obligations of WTO members, a decision taken according to Article 9.2 of Marrakesh Agreement. I think that we need it today urgently, this clarification, what means to add and what means to diminish rights and obligations. A uh, question regarding um, relationship between accession protocols, working party reports, and space agreement. Uh, I think that, that we should differentiate when we speak about uh, working party reports. We should dif differentiate between provisions which are international obligations of a member and uh, provisions which are, are not uh, international obligations and they do not create any legal consequences. Uh, regarding the relationship of working party reports with the multilateral trade agreements and SPS agreement in particular, I think uh, that any protocol and any working party report is an integral part of the, the WTO agreement. And I recall the argument of China submit it, submitted in rare art dispute when it's told that no protocol is self-contained agreement. It is integral part of WTO agreement. Thank you. Great, thanks, Annie. Uh, continuing along here, you want to go next? 
I agree with Anait that um, uh, the accession protocol of, of Russia and, and the working party report in this dispute had some relevance and actually the panel took it into account in the appellate body also read what was there in the working party report. The problem here I find is that neither the panel nor the appellate body were convinced that the language included in the working party report really allowed Russia to keep asking the EU to be in its entirety, in its entirety free from ASF. So if I, if I recall correctly, the working party report said something along the lines of the bilateral veterinary certificates agreed between the EU and Russia will remain valid until it is replaced by a new one. Um, and then there was some language there, it will remain valid as well as subsequent amendments. So in the end, what the appellate body considered is that uh, irrespective of the language that was included in that moment in the, in the, in the working party report, Russia was, was still under an obligation to comply with its regionalization obligations under the SBS agreement. And there was no clear language in the working party report to kind of shield Russia uh, from uh, from it. Um, I wanted to just make a comment with respect to regionalization and it's linked to the appropriate level of protection of members, which I think I, I, I heard the question and I found it very interesting. The appropriate level of protection in, in SPS disputes is normally left at the discretion of the members imposing SPS measures. So it is the prerogative of WTO members to determine what's their appropriate level of protection. And here the panel found that Russia had a very conservative kind of level of protection and that that was okay. Uh, to me, it's more interesting to link regionalization with whether the measure you impose is more trade restrictive than necessary. So here the idea is, for instance, if a WTO member has a specific plague in its territory, and in this case, Russia, for instance, had ASF in some of its areas since 2007. So if you already have the plague, maybe you'll have to impose an SPS measure that it's not super trade restrictive because you'll have to take into account the fact that in your own territory, the plague is already present. Um, on the contrary, if you are maybe free from a certain plague, maybe your measure may be a m bit more trade uh, restrictive. So I do see a link, not so much with the appropriate level of protection, but with the type of measure that WTO members end up imposing. All right, thank you, Maria. Lorenzo. Yes, thank you, and uh, I'd like to, to touch on the same point, in fact, about um, uh, how we can uh, build on the findings of this case in order to um, to, to learn from, uh, from this and, uh, and um, uh, one idea would be to collect best practice from different regional uh, uh, SPS related cooperation agreements and uh, to look into, their risk into how they've built into risk-based and uh, science-based uh, uh, provisions uh, for the regionalization aspects. So to look into Article 6 and to see how it has been implemented in practice in different, uh, by different members, um, because uh, there's, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, interesting uh, material that uh, has been uh, brought to light uh, today and, uh, and more, uh, what constitutes uh, a zone. Uh, is it an administrative zone? Uh, is it an artificial uh, boundary? Is it a natural boundary? How do regionalize uh, a disease? Uh, how does a disease spread? So there's a lot of science uh, questions. There's also a lot of institutional questions that could be usefully asked. Uh, how do you contain a crisis? What, what do you do to contain a crisis? What institutional mechanisms are necessary? And uh, so I think it would be interesting to, to build on, uh, on these aspects and uh, to, to review them uh, and uh, to have uh, also uh, yes, uh, expert opinion about, about them. Thank you. All right, thanks, Lorenzo, and thanks to all the panelists for those first round of, of answers. We have time then to go back to uh, you folks again for another round of questions, if there are any. Yep, John Sebastian. Thank you, Robert. I'm Jess Lord, uh, Senior Legal Advisor at the Canadian Mission, successor to Rob 
Um, Article 6 uh, is not a model of clarity, but that keeps us trade lawyers busy, so I'm not going to complain about that. But I'd like to hear what you have to say on the relationship between Article 6.1 and 6.3. Um, I, I'm a bit puzzled by the appellate body uh, reasoning uh, in paragraph 566 of the appellate body report when they said that the job of a panel under uh, uh, Article 6.3 is to assess um, whether uh, the evidence is of a nature, quantity, quality sufficient to enable the importing member's authorities to make a determination on the pest status. <clears throat> So the, I'm wondering what's the margin of uh, examination that uh, an importing country has once uh, the uh, evidence adduced by the exporting country is considered to be sufficient. Under 6.1, um, if the evidence has been found to be sufficient under 6.3, what's the margin left for the importing country to say that it disagrees with the evidence somehow or to adapt its measures uh, correctly. Um, I would think that it would be beneficial for the membership to have uh, more clarity from the appellate body on, the, on Article 6.1 uh, of the effect of a determination that the evidence is sufficient under 6.3. I'd like to, if you have any views on this, I'd be happy to hear them. Thank you. Great, thanks for that question. Any more? We'll collect a few before we go back to the panelists. There's a lot of hands, go ahead. If I may, just, just because that debate, I think, is where the real link is, Maria, I think you're, you're hitting <laughs> the nail on the head here. That wh what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about the definitional authority the, the, the of, a of, a, of a member to uh, d determine the appropriate level of protection or to determine what its essential security interests are? Um, and if we're talking about that, that certainly th there should be and must be the space and the clarity to distinguish between high politics and low politics, and where we're talking about something that is as essential as life and death of people or entire swine populations or national security, then there must be difference and that needs to be in the system. And I think the system is showing that it can deal with that, but we need to remind the system of continuing to do that. However, once that definition has been done or uh, has, been, has, been, has been made, there is legitimacy and there is space, if properly managed, for the rest of the world and the system to actually look at whether or not what a member claims is necessary or appropriate to address that issue passes whatever test we apply, necessity, smell test, anything in between, appropriateness, you know, proportionality, a lot has been said about that. And I think that's, that's where this nature of the beast, meaning the peacetime constitution of world trade, uh, can and must play its distinctive role. And I agree. Uh, this case is an, is an example of how that can be done. Uh, very much thanks to Craig uh, for pointing that out. I think there's a number of other cases where we will find that. Um, but the system necessarily also has to skirt the edges. I, I think that's... There is there is some gray zones, uh, there are some gray zones, and I think we should be confident but careful in allowing the system to go there, rather than claiming. You know, when I see the word self-judging provision, I, I believe people have abdicated their responsibility because nothing nothing is self-judging. It can't be. No system can accept self-judging. You can accept self-definition, self self-defining, self self self-assessing, but self-judging, no. Sorry, that was a comment again. Oh, that's a good comment and, and something I think some of the panels will have something to, to respond to. Let's take um, one or two more questions first before we go on. Question on what Maria said, that if you have a disease in your own territory, then you should be uh, even more or less trade restrictive than if you don't have it. But I, I would have thought actually when you experience such a disease and the impact of such terrible, devastating diseases, then actually you might want to be even more <coughs> trade restrictive. I mean, I don't, I don't see the rela relationship between having a disease on your territory 
and, uh, and the degree of trade restrictiveness, because if it is really scientifically proven that such diseases are of major devastation impact and also spreading, then you, you have to be careful for health reasons, uh, whether you have it on your territory or you don't have it on your territory. Thank you. Thanks for that. We'll take one more question before we turn to the panelists. If we have one more. All right, we'll give you a bit more time to think of some additional questions because we are going to have a bit more time even after this round is done. So while you're thinking, uh, these folks can take a first crack at what we have now. I have our three questions. Relationship between 6.1 and 6.3 and some, some comments made by the appellate body on that. Follow-up question on the appropriate level of protection and whether there's some space to challenge the, the um, self-determination of it, self-definition of it, uh, and uh, the implications of disease in one's own territory for the appropriateness of the response. Uh, volunteers to go first. Well, I would agree that Article 6 is not the most clear provision um, in the SPS agreement, uh, unfortunately, and I'm not sure I have the answer to, to, to the question. I would love to know uh, uh, all the answers under the SPS agreement. Um, one interesting thing is that the first time I read uh, Article 6.1 of the SPS agreement, working where I work in the ACWL and usually taking the perspective of a developing or a least developed country, I thought it was a very difficult obligation to comply with. You have to adapt your SPS measures to the regional SPS characteristics of other countries and how difficult it might be to gather all the information necessary to make a determination as to what's the SPS status of country A and country B that exports to me. So, so, so that was my first um, reaction when reading uh, Article 6.1. I didn't really read it from the perspective of a developed country that might have access to more scientific information. Uh, so it's very interesting, uh, uh, that question. To me, when I read the appellate body report, I thought, well, okay, that's a way of, you know, reading it, the relationship between 6.1 and 6.3. What do I have to do as an importing member? I have the obligation to adapt my measure to regional SPS characteristics, but uh, if you exporting member claim that you have these areas that are free from, from the pest or the disease, please show it to me, because you are best placed to, to gather um, um, all this information. Uh, I didn't really think, actually, of you know, a situation in which I'm the importing member and I'm not convinced at all by the scientific information that I've been provided. And then what? Can I just disregard what the exporting member has given me and uh, still not adapt my, my SPS uh, measure to that. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer. Did this standard of review created by the appellate body looks a bit like, like in the anti-dumping cases, it's, it's not a de novo review, it's not, um, you just look at whether the evidence presented was good enough for the importing member to you know, take it into account and, and, and really adapt uh, its measure. Um, with respect to, 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 the, to the second question, uh, you might be right that you know the, the, the approach is wrong and the fact that you have a pest or a disease in your territory should not affect what you do. Um, I, I, I don't think that was the approach taken by the appellate body, at least with respect to regionalization. Um, so for instance, when the appellate body um, agreed with the panel that Russia failed to adapt its measure to, to the regional characteristics in the EU, one of the things it noted is, aha, Russia, you have ASF in some areas of your territory. Why are you requesting the EU to be entirely free from ASF? You don't even accept live pigs or pig products from areas that are free from ASF. When these products might end up in some of your areas that do have ASF, so I think the appellate body's approach was, at least in that respect, uh, 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 different and, and really taking into account what's your SPS situation ex ante before you impose an SPS measure on, on another member. 
but there might be, of course, different different ways of approaching it. Thanks. Yes, thank you. I think uh, it's uh, th th there were a lot of interesting questions. Um, I'll start also from uh, thinking of um, the gathering of the evidence, which was uh, an important part of the preliminary uh, 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 the preliminary aspects of, uh, of this case. There was a, a long uh, a period in which the, the two parties were corresponding back and forth with Russia, asking for more and more reassurance regarding uh, from, from the EU regarding the regionalization of this uh, disease. And in fact, the fact that there were several outbreaks of the disease in different member states didn't help the situation very much because uh, it wasn't just as the other two, uh, two incidents that I presented in my, in my notes, that there was just two uh, outbreaks in two specific zones. This was a much more spread out uh, disease. So that's, uh, uh, I think that the, the question about the evidence is an important one, and how do you build a sufficient body of ed evidence uh, regarding regionalization is an interesting aspect to that, because uh, it, uh, as, uh, as you were commenting also, uh, it's not easy for uh, the importing party to gather all the information uh, that the exporting party may have at, at its disposal uh, to make an informed judgment. And, uh, and in a sense, I think that, that touches upon uh, what, what Mina was saying. And uh, I, I wouldn't think that it's a, it's a, it's a reason uh, why you would assess the risk differently as it being a high risk or a low risk or a, a, or a, or a low risk. But it can inform the risk management strategy, not the assessment of the gravity of the risk, but the, mm, the way you're, how you're managing it can be informed by your previous experience in managing the risk risk within your own country. So I do understand what, you, what, what the panel was referring to, that Russia had experience in managing this risk within its own territory. And so it could build upon that experience, uh, if, you, if you will. But, uh, but it does require uh, it being informed uh, to uh, the extent uh, where it is, uh, it is possible by evidence which is produced by the other party. So I think that these two <coughs> aspects are both uh, quite, quite important and, uh, and very relevant to successfully resolving disputes before they hit uh, the, the stage of litigation. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. I wanted to respond to Hans, but he's out of the room, so. Okay. Um, you could respond for the benefit of others if you want. Okay, well, I need first time. Okay. okay, thank you. Regarding the relationship between Article 6.1 and 6.3 of SPS agreement, uh, in my perception, the SPS agreement is something like a subtle compromise between interests of exporting and importing members. And the problem which I see in, the, in, in this decision is uh, in the fact that it shifts excessive burden on importing members. There are a lot of findings in the report of appellate body which prove this. And uh, among them, um, 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 I recall the finding when appellate body said that, uh, the export, that that importing member may be in breach of its obligations uh, provided in, uh, uh, under Article 6.1, even in cases where exporting member had, had failed to provide necessary evidence uh, uh, under Article 6.3. And I see a great problem is this statement. Thank you. All right, well, I come from a political culture where it's rude to speak of someone when he's not in the room, but I, uh, I'll respond to a few things that Hans had to say. I do want to stress that the non-reviewability uh, under 21 is, is considered not a rule but a norm. Uh, and I would say that a good thumbnail uh, definition of a norm is a rule modified by politics. Uh, and this has been something consistent in, in the jurisprudence of, of, of 21. But uh, just, just to respond to what Hans had to say, certainly John Jackson agrees with you on the points of potential reviewability. And so there's, there's some interesting <laughs> seminal law journal articles about this. And there is, there exists the theoretical 
uh, challenge to a country's invocation, but it has thus far remained theoretical, and I'm one of those who, who believes that, that for good, solid political reasons it should remain theoretical. If we wanted to look at the text, one could argue that it, it's significant that the authors did not include security within Article 20. They did make it a separate article. They did not include uh, the chapeau language. They did not include an explicit necessity test. Uh, but one thing that, that I do think of sometimes, the, the solution that some people have come up with on problematic uh, withholding of consensus within the system. Again, here we have a, a norm and not a rule, uh, the rule of, of consensus and how it has developed over time. Uh, in some political cases in which consensus has been withheld, including, for example, in the extension of observer status to specific groups, or in cases involving the accession of countries when, there, when there's a political issue, sometimes the, the solution has been put forward that we won't relax the norm, we will continue to enforce the rule of consensus in the way that we have, but if countries insist upon withholding consensus, they should at least be obliged to say why. Now, Perhaps some would argue, I've seen this in at least one law journal article, if a country is going to invoke national security, they should at least be obliged to, to give a statement and not simply say, Article 21, game over. Uh, whether this is in itself moving the ball forward, uh, I, I, I have my doubts. But nonetheless, it is an active discussion. It's been going on for decades in the law journals. I, for one, am glad that it takes place there rather than actually in panels and the AV. Thanks again. Thanks to all the panelists for your um, here for your uh, responses. Uh, we do still have a bit of time, and I'm informed that we don't have any questions from the online viewership. So, feel free to uh, take the advan take advantage of this time to ask some more. Hugo. Thank you. Uh, congratulations for the presentation. Um, I'm Hugo Romero from Mexican Mission. Uh, at some point, I was in charge of SPS matters here. I think that we are not uh, considering one fact uh, regarding whether there are a lot of burdens on the importing member or whether there are less for the exporting member. The authorities uh, on, on SPS matters, they have a close and continued uh, re communication. They, they, they meet each other bilaterally. They meet at the pertinent organizations. There are only few cases where they bring cases, U.S. animals, India agricultural products, Russian pigs. But the rest of the time, here at the WTO, not on the disputing uh, part, they, they met. We raised issues on the SPS uh, committee. We raised the issues bilaterally here. So the communication uh, is very close, and I don't agree with uh, the statements w about there are a lot of obligations or duties on the importing members. Uh, also, I think my authorities, and I don't know what would be the, the rest of the authorities, they pay, they pay more, at, more attention to the facts, to the scientific e evidence, rather than the AB reports or panel reports. Those are re read by lawyers. And well, it's good. Any other questions? Thank you very much uh, for the panel's um, ex detailed explanation of what happens in this case and uh, the, juris the new jurisprudence that is given by the upper body in particular. Uh, I have a one uh, question for the panel which puzzles me and makes me feel uh, in a difficult situation to understand, uh, which is um, Article 6.2, um, the Apple body's interpretation of recognize the concept. Uh, I will try to make, uh, present my problem clearly, but if not, uh, please forgive me because it's, I think, partially due to the complexity of Article 6 and the interpretation of the Apple body. Um, turn back uh, for the uh, uh, interpretation of the Apple body on rec uh, 
recognize the concept is uh, mostly uh, elaborated in its um, in its funding from paragraph five uh, one twenty three to five one twenty six. Uh, in that uh, particular finding, uh, the apple body actually reads, um, you know, in giving the meaning to recognize and the concept, uh, the apple body seems to start with the text of it and uh, uh, the dictionary meaning of recognize and concept, and then it runs on to analyze um, Article 6.1 and 6.3, and um, then uh, basically, um, from my understanding, is that it reads the insure in Article 6.1 and um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, how to say, the uh, um, Article 3 in the sense that when export members, uh, when it presents um, uh, its claim, and there should be a kind of a uh, corresponding, um, how to say, entertaining of uh, such a claim, the, the, the whole thing's put together that makes the Apple body find that uh, the recognize in Article 6.2 should be read as kind of render operation of the concept. I mean, it's it puzzles me a lot because actually, from my understanding, Article 6.2 has two sentences. In its first sentence, it's, it gives uh, the obligation to recognize the concept, and in second sentence, it's the determination shall follow, shall be based on the factors such as. So for me, it, it is more it is uh, more reasonable to read render operational into the second sentence of Article 6.2 rather than into Article 6.1, uh, sorry, uh, uh, rather than the, the first sentence of, uh, of Article 6.2. Um, so that's, um, that's my problem. I don't know if you could help me with that. Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks for that uh, question. If we have one more question, then we can wrap it up with a final set of answers from the panel. And if we don't have one more question, then we will go straight to the panel to wrap it up on these one and a half questions. Uh, first on the interpretation of recognize in Article 6.2, and if anybody wants to react to Hugo's comment about the distribution of burden, especially when parties already talk to each other quite a lot in their SPS authorities. So I, I, I couldn't agree more with Hugo. <laughs> uh, that's why as a trade lawyer, when I first read Article 6.1, I thought, oh my god, what a burden. But then when I read the appellate bodies report, I think there, there's some sort of recognition that cooperation shouldn't be that difficult in practice when SPS authorities already talk um, to each other. With respect to the interpretation of Article 6.2, I, I, I wish I I had the answer. Um, I don't work at the appellate body secretariat anymore, so um, now I'm free to discuss what I agree or I don't agree with. And I think it's a very good point that probably the second sentence of Article 6.2, which talks about determination of specific areas, probably accommodates better this, this notion of rendering the concepts um, operational. I just think the appellate body was afraid of leaving the first sentence of Article 6.2 completely meaningless. And, and uh, in these days uh, when sometimes WTO members challenge or make claims with respect to specific sentences in specific provisions, um, maybe the appellate body thought what happens if a WTO member just refuses to adapt its SPS measures to regional conditions? but still says that it recognizes in the abstract these concepts. Can we say that it complies with Article 6.2, first sentence? And, and I think the appellate body didn't feel comfortable with that. And, and I, I agree, though, that it included 
uh, uh, more notions in the concept of, of recognition than what it initially one would think recognized means. Thank you. Uh, I think that it is the second uh, sentence of Article 6.2, rather than the first one, which speaks on operational, or making operational concept. I see the problem in the findings of appellate body, uh, since uh, according to the appellate body, a member which has in place a legal framework recognizing regional regionalization concept c can still be in breach with, with its obligations under Article 6.2, since this, op since this legal fra framework is not operational. And this uh, leads the interpretation of Article 6.2 to redundancy and inutility. I think so. Thank you. Great, thanks. Any additional comments on the outside speakers? No, just to say that uh, I do agree with Ugo that uh, indeed the, the level of, uh, of, um, of cooperation in this particular case was, was quite high. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it is uh, generally the case in all, uh, so my, my remarks before, I was saying it's not necessarily the case. Uh, in, in this one, of course, uh, the, the, the level of cooperation that I presented uh, was quite high. It may not always be the same. So in, in general, the, the burden on the, on the importing country can be uh, quite high, in at least in the hypothetical case of uh, of uh, two countries where uh, cooperation is not as uh, as close as the one that we have before us today, and uh, stop here. Thank you. Uh, I think then that will wrap it up with that. It uh, brings to a close our time. Uh, I just like to say, by way of a few closing remarks, that it, uh, it seems like a, a very interesting dispute, both from the point of view of the technical issues that it raised uh, and the political context in which it uh, in which it was in which it took place. Uh, we have been uh, blessed with a very comprehensive treatment uh, of it today by the panelists, each of which had uh, a slightly different uh, perspective uh, and approached it from a different angle, uh, and we had some. Uh, I think ultimately a certain amount of optimism that of the capacity of the system to deal with disputes that may have a high politics overhang, uh, but also some potential concern about what might be on the horizon if it, if it does get tested. Uh, also at some concern about whether or not the treatment of some of the issues, uh, especially whether the AB has placed additional burdens on members, uh, but it nonetheless is a good example of regulatory cooperation uh, that largely works in this case and is a model for cooperation that this dispute seems to stand for is the way to deal with disputes. Uh, with that, then I think I would uh, conclude the event uh, on behalf of the co-organizers, WTI advisors and the ICTSD. We thank you all of you for your active participation. Uh, thank you, of course, uh, to uh, the panelists, uh, again to the permanent mission of Mexico for its um, support in this, the W2 conference service facility and the ICTSD support team, um, all of whom assisted in making this event uh, as good as it is. Uh, so with that, a round of applause for the panelists and for everybody else who participated. Thank you. And one final reminder, please fill out the feedback forms on your way out uh, so that we can get your input. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Talking Dispute series. Thank you.